everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. Post lunch. Want to do a quick stretch before that? Let's get up. Let's get up. Come on. Let's do it. Oh, okay. Let's do it with me. Oh, this is blockchain week. We need all the energy we need. We can get. <laughs> yeah. There we go. That's a good one. Thanks, Kevin. Cool. Um, so welcome to SF Blockchain Week. I'm glad to see all of you guys here. We have with us today Linda Lees from Zcash. Um, Linda, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at Zcash and what Zcash really is? Great. Hi, everyone. My name's Linda, San Francisco special me because uh, I'm a graduate of Berkeley, go Bears. And I currently work at Zcash, which is a cryptocurrency with strong privacy guarantees built on strong science. We use zero-knowledge proofs, specifically ZK snarks, to verify encrypted transactions on the blockchain. We like to describe ourselves as the HTTPS of Bitcoin. I don't know if that's actually catchy or not, but I am a product manager at Zcash and I'm working to build a mobile application that brings shielded addresses to mobile devices. Uh, before our network upgrade, which is coming this October at the end of the month, it was computationally infeasible to have shielded transactions on mobile devices, so we're really excited to get a product out the door. What do you do, Tara, at IDEO? Um, thanks, Linda. Um, I have so many more questions for you. What are <laughs> shielded transactions? So interesting. Um, so I'm with IDEO. IDEO is a design and innovation uh, studio that's been around for the last 30 years. Um, we are really about integrating design and engineering. You know, we design products like the first Apple mouse and so on and so forth, and now we're focused. Um, we have a venture studio that's focused on blockchain and emerging tech. Great. Cool. So tell us a little bit more. Why is privacy such an important feature um, to you guys? And, you know, uh, and what are shielded transactions? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> uh, Zcash's mission is to give everybody economic freedom. And we think that to have true economic freedom, you need privacy. So if your government is not uh, the kindest to their citizens, or if encryption is illegal, like in certain countries, uh, being caught using cryptocurrency could actually be pretty dangerous. And if you could, I guess, think anything what you want, but you had to say it out loud, I don't think you actually have the freedom to think, just like how Every time you spend something, if your Twitter blasted out that you bought Starbucks again for $7, I don't know if that's actually being free to spend. So I just think that shielded transactions, which are like normal transactions, except the sender, receiver, the amount, and uh, the metadata is encrypted, is just a really good way to um, make cryptocurrencies actually more feasible as a medium of exchange to buy goods and services, um, yeah. So to draw, to draw an analogy, is it like, you know, when you use Venmo and it blasts out, oh, I paid Linda 20 bucks for ramen <laughs> um, <laughs> yesterday, and it kind of, you know, sort of broadcasts it to my entire network versus me choosing to keep it private. Is that a good example or a good analogy for that? Yeah, I think it is a good analogy for that. When you use Zcash, if you choose to use shielded transactions, you can choose to disclose uh, that payment information to a select group of people, to the public, or just to keep it private. So that's our distinguishing feature. A lot of other cryptocurrencies, they all of their transactions are by default public to all of the world, or certain cryptocurrencies have privacy guarantees, but all of your transactions are always private. So if you want to send your transactions to an accountant or pay your taxes or make regulators happy, it's a little bit difficult, so, yeah. I was actually wondering, uh, you work with a lot of cryptocurrency startups at your lab, is it called CoLab? It's called CoLab. Yeah, so Tara works with a bunch of different cryptocurrency and blockchain startups, and uh, what do you think the biggest advantage of bringing in design early into this emerging technology is, and do you have any particular um, pain points that you see and how you go about solving them? Yeah, so um, just to give a little bit of context, at IDEO Collab, we partner with a lot of early stage founders and startups to really bring design into the um, sort of the product process very early on, the strategy process very early on. We see design as more of a um, sort of a framework to prototype and iterate and get through uh, to new solutions. 
Um, so, for example, we've worked with a bunch of companies like Augur and Handshake to, you know, sort of get their products earlier to market. Um, I'm a huge proponent of sort of design, a design-driven process because I think that designers are inherently problem solvers um, by nature. Really what a designer does is that they investigate a problem and try to pr prototype new sort of solutions, new user behavior around that. And I think in the context of emerging technology, that's even more sort of pertinent because what we're trying to do is prototype new user behaviors whether it's new user behavior around ownership, new user behavior around data privacy or private transactions, what we're trying to do is, is to sort of to encourage and to tweak, um, you know, sort of these habits that are now part of our daily lives to kind of make them better and more secure for all of us. So I think that's the power of design, and I really encourage um, technical founders, especially, to work with designers and not be afraid of us <laughs> in many ways. Um, so Linda, as a designer, um, what are some of the biggest trade-offs you make or you have to, or you sort of face in your day-to-day -day work between sort of designing for, for privacy and security and usability? Oh, that's a great question. At Zcash, we're really concerned about privacy and security. I mean, everyone does, but that is our distinguishing factor, so we have to be especially considerate of that. And it's really tough. I think that... Uh, there are some times where you have to sacrifice privacy for usability or usability for privacy. And it really depends on getting to know your audience, doing some market research, and starting to think about what the users want and letting that actually inform the design of the protocol or the design of the architecture. And one instance where we actually made a trade-off for privacy instead of usability is that when we were building our application, uh, Zcash wallets uh, shielded transactions are, like I said, encrypted on the blockchain by default. So you actually have to take your key and try to decrypt every single shielded transaction on the blockchain just to see if it's yours. And that's really computationally in intensive and not ideal for a mobile applications. So what we actually have is a centralized server that downloads all of the shielded transaction, parses it, and processes it so that it's actually easier to consume for mobile applications, but we still broadcast all of the shielded transactions to all clients. And that way we can actually make the application uh, easier to use, doesn't consume as much data, has less lag time, but preserves privacy as well. And I think that another case where we actually try to make a trade-off for usability instead of privacy are that our shielded addresses are actually quite long. They're even longer than Bitcoin addresses, but instead of trying to get users to verify all of the address in our upcoming wallet, we actually just show them the first six characters and the last six characters of their address because the way that our addresses work, we have a checksum at the end, and if those two things likely match, it would probably be okay. So. We're trying to just make the experience a little bit easier for people who are using it without violating their assumptions on how things work, if they're safe, and what they're doing, and things like that. And at Zcash, the way that our designers actually work with protocol engineers and Android developers is really great. We're just on the same team, and it's not just that they decide to do something and we just draw or implement what they want, and just expose the features, or we just tell them, hey, we want this feature, and they have to design the protocol. It's actually pretty interactive, so I think that's really special. I know that you work with a lot of different companies mm -hmm. at CoLab, and do you think that that's something that you see very often, or is that something that you want to see more? And especially for very technical people, or founders, or strategists, how do you suggest that they start working with designers on their own team or even companies like CoLab? How can they yeah. take advantage of you? Yeah, so just to unpack um, <laughs> you know, all the great stuff you said just now <laughs> and I totally agree with, and, and to kind of build on that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you sort of mentioned, um, you know, designing friction at some points um, can be a really powerful thing. You know, mm -hmm. just sort of reminding people uh, to keep their, their private keys safe, to keep them in a safe space. You know, the first time I opened a uh, Bitcoin wallet in 2010, I took a screenshot of my keys and emailed it to myself because that was the most convenient thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Security freaks in a room are freaking out right now. 
don't hate me. This was, this was back in 2010. I think, you know, um, fast forward, now we're in 2018, I think people are um, more aware um, of the need to keep these things safe. There's a sense of paranoia. There's a sense of sort of urgency. There's a sense of like, oh my goodness, I don't know what, I, I need to keep this safe and I'm panicking about it. And that, that sort of moment of panic, I think is a great sort of, um, it's a key moment to design for in all these products and applications that we're building today. Like, you know, this is part of the key infrastructure um, that I think we're, we're wanting to solve, whether it's in custodial services or better key management, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, just to unpack it a little bit more, you said design, you know, designing friction at, at the right places, um, but then you mentioned something about um, sort of breaking sort of long addresses into more human readable elements as well, which is like the last four digits and the first four, am I right? I think it's the first five and the last six or something like, something that. like that. But yeah. Yeah. So the human mind the, the human mind can kind of read it and, and break it down into into space. So that's 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 really cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the summary. To get back to you, uh, <laughs> like I said, uh, how do you like it or what is your ideal working situation for working with other companies or co-founders? Yeah. How do they work yeah, with designers? I mean, so um, one of the first projects we did, we um, did a major collaboration with Augur, um, which is a prediction markets platform built on Ethereum. And this was back in, um, you know, I would say a year ago, a year ago now, summer 2016. So we, we worked with them pretty closely. Um, the way we see it is that we augment their engineering team with a design team, um, you know, f and we sort of are, sort of working um, next to them for a good three to six months and, and, and sort of working out the kinks in um, user experience, in UI, in um, you know, sort, of, uh, sort of the key challenges that a user might face when in, um, sort of encountering a decentralized app. You know, everything from connecting to a new Augur node to um, you know, creating a key and having to download it to um, the, the reporting process, which was you know, something that we worked through a couple of times to kind of make it more and more sort of uh, intuitive and easy to use. So th these are all sort of very new concepts, I think. You know, it's very, they're very powerful ideas, you know, the idea of a decentralized oracle or a reporting process. These are, these are great concepts, but I think what we needed to do was to sort of handhold the user through this process, especially since this is the first time, you know, sort of in the world we're doing this. Mm -hmm. I have a fun question for you. Yes. So out of all of the different, I guess, user experience issues in the space, uh, which one annoys you the most? Or which one would you want to fix if you could just fix it right away? The u like one key moment in the space? Yeah, uh, one key moment or one kind of action that's particularly yeah. aggravating, something that's non-standardized or makes analogies it shouldn't. Oh, um, <laughs> so many. Uh, I think uh, onboarding is a, a tough one. I think private key management is, sh you know, is, is right now still super painful. It's extremely painful. I think um, there's still uh, not a lot of education around it. There isn't a, a smooth solution for it. I know a couple of teams working on great um, experiments around it, or, you know, sort of more uh, intuitive sort of flow and experience and, and, and sort of advice and keeping your keys safe. Um, I think there are, uh, you know, I think that, that sort of private key management should always be an option, right? You mm -hmm. can always go to great uh, custody services, but I think having that option is really part of the ethos of this entire space. Yeah, um, I think that people actually lose their key or back it up incorrectly or yeah. back it up insecurely or yeah. not back it up and run over their phone a lot. So <laughs> right. that's a really painful one. Yeah, yeah I think that the... Oh, how about you? What do, you? what do you think? Oh, man. I have, I have two things that bug me, but they're kind of the same. I feel like it has to do with the same numerical input. So just hear me out on this one. Uh, something that really bugs me, and this isn't a problem unique to Zcash, but it's just that one Bitcoin or one Zcash, it's not a unit that people usually think of. So one dollar buys you something that you can think of, but what does, do you buy things that are $6,000 on a regular basis? Or one Zcash buys you at like 42.7 coffees? So it's just a little bit hard to get your mind to wrap around it and you're sending things that are 0 0.00357892 infinitely divisible. And I think that that's just kind of hard to get around when you're dealing with, uh, I feel like, 
it makes the money seem more fake from a psychological and social level to users. And on top of those numbers being confusing, because I actually try to use Zcash to buy things online like pearl earrings and toothpaste. Uh, another thing that really aggravates me is that not only is the numerical input like, oh, I don't really know what this means, but when you send it, the fee isn't standard, so sometimes I pay for it, sometimes the merchant pays for it, sometimes if I send one Zcash, one Zcash is sent and then the fee is debited in addition, or sometimes it subtracts it and I actually only send 0.99 Zcash, and then the fee isn't standard at all. So it's like, okay, now that I'm sending 0.38 blah, 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 but I don't even, not only do I not know what that means, I actually don't actually know the amount that I sent until after I've sent it. So, and it already depends on which app you use. So I think this space has a lot of work to do and I think that it goes from big, huge ideas to how do you keep your money safe and you know, how do you suggest people to use things like keys or really strong backup phrases when they're not very usable to we can't really send money because we don't know how much we're sending. So there's a lot to yeah. do. It's about confidence, right? It's about a user's confidence in transacting in whatever cryptocurrency it is. You know, and if we're you know, in that use case, if we're off by a decimal point, it can be pretty disastrous, right? Depending on which which currency. Um, I'm I'm kind of curious, like you know, in your in your work, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers to adoption and to actual sort of you know um, mass scalability to use case, you know, sort of you know uh, you know people using cryptocurrency in, in day to day. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the biggest barriers. Well, I, don't, I think one of the biggest barriers to adoption is that the infrastructure isn't there for people to use it in a way that they want to yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people are complaining about how everyone's using cryptocurrency as a mode of speculation, and we don't want that, rah, rah, rah. But I feel like that's the infrastructure that exists for that use case. I know that there are some countries that are moving towards using cryptocurrencies as a store of value. So countries like Venezuela are experiencing hyperinflation. So they actually don't mind the volatility of cryptocurrency. They say, oh boy, Bitcoin only went down by 32%. Our Bolivar went down 50% every single day for a month. So this is actually really great. And those people just want to put their money in, get their money out in fiat at the time of use, but just store their money where it's at relatively. And that's a different use case for me that just wants to buy toothpaste on Amazon. And I actually want good point of sale systems and payment systems and memo fields so that I can do accounting. And I think that the biggest barrier to adoption right now is that we're trying to please everyone. And if you look at a wallet, you don't really know what to do with it. Yes, you can generate raw transactions and send it to a particular address, but it's not really ideal for speculators or people who use it as a store of value or people who want to use it as a medium of exchange. So I think that we should just target different users and really just do some market research and go after how we should actually be using some of these things. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think, you know, um, in the design process, we talk about designing for different personas and different designing for different use cases. Um, what are some of those personas and use cases that you see across the industry? I, I think, you know, you, you laid out a couple of um, great examples. I think there are, um, you know, folks who want to transact with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Some people want to keep it as a store of, of, of uh, value, especially in countries which have more volatile currencies. Um, I think people, some people just want to keep it as speculation, right? Mm -hmm. there are, there's a range of use cases, um, and I think, I think where design really helps is that, uh, and where human-centered design really helps is that we really start um, sort of interviewing and understanding and researching the different users and user archetypes, and then you know really understanding what do they want from each use case, um, and then sort of designing features and um, interactions and key moments for that. I mean, that's a very key part of the design process in itself. Do you guys do any of that as eCash? Is that something that you guys are working towards? Yeah, and we actually have user personas written for our wallet already. There's five. I don't know if the audience wants to hear them because they're very specific yeah. to the project, but. I was just going to ask you, uh, do you have a favorite user persona that you like has a special place in your heart or something? I feel like for me, I think there are these early adopters or miners or people who are just technology enthusiasts, but the people that have a place in my heart are what are called 
the laggards, which is kind of a sad term to call these people, but people like your mom or your grandma that don't know what they're doing. And it's because the reason I got into usability and design is because I have a background in computer security, but my mom never knew what I'm talking about. And I thought I could expose all of these cool cryptographic primitives and all these things like that to people who don't understand. And they're my favorite user group because once you got them, everyone else is probably into it too. So what's your favorite user persona yeah. or group? I, well, I can't, I can't choose. I have to cop <laughs> out and say that. Um, but in, uh, at IDEO, we use um, sort of this, this phrase, designing for the edges. Mm -hmm. So when you design for the extremes, extreme use cases, whether it's the heavy sort of um, speculator to, uh, you know, your, um, you know, sort of average, you know, sort of uh, mom and pop, grocery owner who doesn't know much about blockchain, when you design for the edges and like extremes, you some, somehow find ways to sort of meet everything else in the middle. So that's oh, a kind of a nice design principle to work for. Uh, you know, it, it may not be that uh, these people are the heaviest users of your product, but by designing for the edges, you kind of, you know, sort of find sort of the sort of the top and most optimal sort of um, part of the bell curve. Oh, what's one example of where you designed for the edge and caught some people in the middle? Does the Augur project have a good example for that? Well, the Augur project was pretty specific. They were looking for um, traders and people Ooh. into blockchain mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, uh, uh, people who are into prediction markets. So it was a very sort of narrow niche that they were okay. looking for for their target audience. Okay, um, I guess it didn't apply there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Another project perhaps? Um, well, we have to we have to think. I mean, right now we're uh, you know working on a variety of different projects, including um, some work in the NFT space, um, and that's an interesting area that I think. What does um, NFT stand for? Oh, good question. <laughs> yes, all the acronyms. Um, NFTs are non fungible tokens, mm -hmm. so they're the idea that um, you know of, uh, sort of uh, assets that are non fungible and can be exchanged. Many mm. ways. So you can have NFT tokens. CryptoKitties is one of the best examples of it. I love um, those. Yeah, and there there are uh, lots of great examples in the art um, and um, uh, sort of gaming space that are cropping up. So we're working on one of those projects, and I'll, I'll let you hopefully give you an update soon. Oh, cool! Decentralized gaming, you say? Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> interesting cool. So in the, the last couple of minutes, I think we have left. Mm -hmm. um, what is your one prediction or one hope for the ecosystem for the next year? I am really excited about a bunch of companies that are bringing uh, supporting solutions at the network level and maybe at the key management or at like address level. Like I know that there are some blockchain projects that specifically try to solve the identification problem. Some people are still trying to solve scalability. And I think that this is the year. I think that when we first started in the space, everyone was just trying to do everything at once. Everyone wanted to solve the scalability problem on their own. Or I think everyone was just doing weird stuff to their network upgrade and protocols. But I feel like we're all specializing and building each other up. And there's a lot more collaboration and really great people joining this space. So I'm hoping for very specific solutions that target single layers that really make this product uh, more commercially scalable. Wonderful. Well, and with that, thank you so much, Linda, thank for being you. with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Linda and Tara. <laughs> you guys can just leave them. All right, so for the next talk, um, as they're making their way off the stage, we're going to be talking about assembling a decentralized query layer for blockchains. And we're going to welcome Alexander Demidko from Fluence to the stage. Mm -hmm.